PhD student in math at NTU, the Nanyang Technological University. He's working on simulations of elementary particles and uses Python extensively for data extraction, analysis, and evaluation of numerical algorithms. And he started using Python almost 10 years ago. Christian. Yeah, hello everybody. Uh, first of all, thanks to the organizers for hosting this wonderful event. Uh, today I want to talk mostly about the multiprocessing module and in a wider sense about concurrent computations in Python. Uh, so very briefly, actually the important facts have been mentioned already, uh, very briefly about me, I'm a PhD student, I'm one of the local universities here. I use Python a lot, in particular NumPy and SciPy, I do data analysis, statistical analysis and uh, stuff like that. And uh, yeah, I will make these slides, or in fact, they are already publicly available. I will also show the link at the end, so in case you're interested, uh, feel free to copy them. Okay, so the question is, why do we actually want to do concurrent computations? And there are a few uh, key observations, which some of you probably have seen in their own uh, programs before. Um, first of all, I think we all agree on the fact that Python is pretty awesome, but we, are all, we also know the, uh, its limitations, uh, and one of the problems of Python is certainly it's not the fastest language, at least if you don't use like C extensions or something. Um, furthermore, if you, look at, um, if you look at modern CPU architectures, you actually see that more modern CPU architectures actually consist of an increasing number of cores. But that actually the performance of a single core is only improving very slowly right now. So actually, the performance gains of modern CPUs are actually essentially by adding more and more cores, but the performance of a single core is actually not increasing a lot. And then we probably all, I mean, if you ever worked on a problem where uh, you do a lot of blocking operations, for example, you have to read and write lots of data, then even if your program only uses a single core, actually that core will be idling a lot of the time because the core basically has to wait, uh, wait until some memory access operations or hard disk drive operations have been finished. So this all means that potentially all these things can introduce bottlenecks into your program and slow down performance. And concurrency can help with all of these problems. Of course, it always depends on the problem and the uh, application you're working on. So, um, so you came to the conclusion that you want to use concurrency in Python, so what do you do? If you just use doc Python, you essentially have two options. You can use the threading module and the multiprocessing module, which are both shipped with standard Python. And, well, as the name suggests, the threading module is for the implementation of threads, while the multiprocessing module actually starts full-fledged uh, sub-processes. The differences, uh, I, will, uh, I will talk about that in a moment, but um, what I want to note here is both modules are actually very similar from a high-level perspective. Actually, the API is really very similar, and for many problems, if you, if you uh, wrote a program which works using threads, then actually often, of course not always, but often actually you can uh, change it very easily to use sub-processes. And yeah, so these modules are great if you want to make use of a modern CPU which has many cores. Uh, if you're interested in more serious computations, like you have a whole computer cluster, you want to use your GPU or you have some exotic hardware accelerators. There are also nice third-party bindings like MPI for um, Pi, PyCuda, PyOpenCL. I'm not going to talk about that, but if you are doing stuff which goes beyond one desktop computer, you might want to have a look at this stuff. Okay, so um, I want to first talk about threads, and there's a common pitfall with threads because as many of you know, there's an infamous global interpreter lock in standard Python. So what is a global interpreter lock? So the global interpreter lock basically prevents that more than one thread is executing Python bytecode byte code at the same time, which might make you wonder what's the whole point of threads then if only one thread at the same time can execute Python bytecode. But first of all, why is there this global interpreter lock? I mean, it's there for a reason. Um, and first of all, it solves the very difficult problem of making the Python interpreter thread safe, which is not, uh, not so easy, because if you have many threads executing bytecode at the same time, writing and reading from different memory locations, a lot of things can go wrong. 
So this is, how to say, a simple solution to the problem of making the Python interpreter thread safe. Um, and in particular, it just simplifies the Python code base at a uh, as, as a result of this, in particular memory management. Now the downside is obvious. If you want to have more than one thread executing Python bytecode at the same time, this is just not going to happen because only one thread at a time will acquire the global interpreter lock while the other threads have to wait until that thread releases the global interpreter lock. So in that sense, you cannot do true parallel computations with threads if all of these threads are just executing native Python bytecode. Um, but what is, to, uh, what is important to mention, and this is one of the main reasons why threads are still useful, is there are actually several operations where the global interpreter lock is being released. And one notable example is, for example, blocking operations like input-output. So if you have one thread which is reading and writing lots of data, you can actually, this, this thread then will release the global interpreter lock and you can have a second thread actually doing useful computations meanwhile and execute Python bytecode. Um, one thing I also want to emphasize is the global interpreter lock is actually not a part of the Python language. This is really um, in, in, an implementation detail of the Python interpreter. And while the standard Python uh, interpreter, CPython and um, PyPy, an alternative uh, Python interpreter, have this global interpreter lock implemented, there are actually also alternative implementations of Python interpreters which do not have a global interpreter lock like JSON and Iron Python. So in them you can actually do real, real parallel computations on the bytecode level with threads. Uh, in any case, if you want to read up more about this whole problem of the global interpreter lock, which is uh, one of the hardest problems probably of Python, um, I can recommend this website here. There are some interesting facts about the global interpreter lock and how it affects your parallel computations. <clears throat> Okay, uh, most of the talk I actually want to talk about the multiprocessing module because it allows us to circumvent this whole problem of the global interpreter lock. But uh, for comparison, I first want to give a very short example about threads and what threads actually are. So um, threads, the advantages of threads is they're actually very lightweight. So all threads, they share the same memory. They share one interpreter instance. So threads can be started, they can be spawned very quickly. Um, and actually, the interpreter is doing nothing special. The, the interpreter, at least the C Python interpreter, is really starting proper operating system level threads. So under Windows, you will have proper Windows threads. On the Unix system, the uh, interpreter will actually start a proper POSIX thread. And um, so threads, as I mentioned, can be useful for I.O. bound problems. So if your problem, if the performance of your program is bound by the fact that it's doing lots of I.O., lots of blocking operations, threads can actually help. Because as I mentioned, during blocking operations, the GIL is released, and then some other threads can actually execute Python, uh, Python bytecode at the same time. Um, but because of the global interpreter lock, if your problem, if your, if the performance of your program, uh, program is really bound by the fact that execution speed is not fast enough, so you have really a compute bound problem, then threads are not going to help you. In fact, if anything, it's making things worse because all those threads are lightweight, they still introduce an additional overhead. So threads won't execute in parallel, plus you introduce an overhead, uh, so, the threaded version of a compute-bound problem in Python is normally slower than just the serial version, which confuses a lot of people um, when they use the threading module for the first time. Um, one thing in general is, also if you want to do concurrent of your uh, computations, in general is there are usually some code sections, and you will see that often in the following um, code examples, you usually have so-called critical sections somewhere in your code. So these are sections which should be not executed by more than one thread or one sub-process at the same time. For example, if you're writing to a file, you don't want that several threads or several sub-processes are writing to the same file. So this would define a critical section. In general, I.O., if you're not on a, on a big computing cluster, in general, I.O. on a desktop computer is serial, so you would define a critical section, and you use that using the so-called lock, which we will see uh, a lot in the code. So whenever you see something framed by these locks, means this code section can be only executed by one sub-process or one thread at the same time. 
Okay, just a very, very simple example just to illustrate the um, syntax. So how would you use uh, threading, the threading module? So usually you would define some kind of function which would then be started as a thread. This example, of course, is trivial. What is this function doing? It's basically only cubing a number and then printing it out. And you see, because input-output is in general not thread safe, you would usually uh, protect this with a so-called lock. So um, you don't want that several sub-processes or several threads are printing out on standard out at the same time and you get this weird interleaved output. So you would prevent that by um, protecting that with a lock. So and then the main part, what do you do? Here we basically just start four threads. So you would just call threading.thread. Target is then the function you want to call. And then an argument list, and then you can start it. So, um, but this is only an illustrative example. Of course, it's not a very useful example for using threads. But let's move on to subprocesses. So uh, what is the difference between the multiprocessing module and the threading module is uh, the multiprocessing module starts really subprocesses. So the difference is each subprocess actually uh, has their own interpreter instance. So they are much more heavyweight. They don't share memory. They don't share anything. There's a full independent subprocess with an own interpreter instance. So they, take this, they introduce significant overhead. But because now each subprocess has their own interpreter instance means that each subprocess also has their own global interpreter lock, which means if you're using subprocesses instead of threads, you can actually uh, execute Python bytecode truly in parallel. Yeah. So um, as I said, the API is actually very similar to the threading module, at least uh, major parts of the library. And if we just look at the very same example we just saw for threadings, but now with uh, the multiprocessing module, you see that the code is essentially the same. Now the only difference is, well, we've changed the import line, obviously. And uh, instead of threading.thread, we now have multiprocessing.process. But besides that, essentially everything is the same. And now the lock is just the one from the multiprocessing module. So, on a superficial level, also regarding the output of this program, nothing really changed. But keep in mind that in the background, actually, uh, very different things happen. Because now, in this example, these worker functions, for each of these worker functions, a whole Python interpreter will be started in the background and then truly executed in parallel. So um, these functions in this example will actually truly run in parallel. OK, so before we jump more into the API, I want to talk a little bit about the theory, because there are a lot of misconceptions if, you, uh, if people start to parallelize code. And one prime example of something that surprises a lot of people is something which is named uh, Amdahl's Law. So first, a common misconception is if you have a program which runs too slow, well, then you just throw n cores at it, and then you can expect a speed-up factor of n. Well, in an ideal world, that would be true, but in practice, it's not going to happen for several reasons. Um, as I mentioned, you usually have some code sections which are inherently serial. If you're writing to a hard disk drive or if you're reading a lot from memory, then these things are bound by, well, how fast your hard disk drive can write or what's the memory bandwidth of your memory. So um, you cannot parallelize these actions because no matter if one, two, or three cores are writing to the hard disk drive, that doesn't make the hard disk drive spin faster. So there are some sections which are inherently serial. You won't be able to speed up by parallel methods. Plus, there are actually some algorithms which are very difficult to parallelize in the first place. Um, for example, um, I mean, uh, a simple example would be a recursive function. You do some complicated computations in a recursive function. It's very, very difficult to parallelize. And usually you have to reformulate the whole problem to avoid a recursive formulation to make it accessible to parallel methods. And last but not least, um, time is money. Usually you don't parallelize all your code. You only parallelize the code sections which are actually worth it. You don't spend like a whole week to parallelize the code section of your problem which only, where the computation, where the runtime is only like two or three percent. So you only parallelize the code sections of your, of your program uh, 
which actually takes the majority of the runtime. And for all of these reasons, what you have, what you end up in practice is that if you parallelize a program, you actually only parallelize a certain part of it, which means another part of the program will still run in serial, so it won't utilize all the cores. So uh, I hope you're not uh, scared by a simple formula, but um, let's assume you have, a, you have a program or problem which runs in runtime T1, so you, have, you run it on one simple core, and you have a runtime of capital T1. And now you parallelize it to N cores, so it now uses N processors, so you have a, a runtime of T capital N. And for the reason just mentioned, you have a certain fraction of your code which is actually not running in parallel. And let's, let's, let be this fraction small f, so it's from 0 to 1. So let's say 10% of your code you didn't parallelize. So f would be 0 0.1. Well, then Amdahl's law basically relates how t1 relates to tn by this expression. And now, what does this formula actually tell us? It tells us the following. If you throw more and more cores at a problem, then, well, this is the parallel section of your program, and this is the constant section serial. So the larger n becomes, the smaller the section this part of your, program, uh, of your problem gets. But at some point, the, the time spent in the serial part of your program and the, the time spent in the parallel part of your problem will be around the same size, or even the serial section will uh, dominate at some point. So the bottom line is actually, for, sufficient, so for sufficiently large n, the runtime is actually dominated by the serial part. So you cannot expect for a large number of cores that you get a speed up factor of n. But actually, you will uh, approach some kind of plateau. So if you just plot these formulas, you will get something like this. So in an ideal world, you would get the orange line. So you really manage to paralyze 100% of your code. Then if you, uh, if you run it with 20 cores, you get a speed up factor of 20. If you run it with 50 cores, you get a speed up factor of 50. But this is like the ideal case. This is usually nothing you will see in practice. Let's assume you actually manage to paralyze 99% of your code. Then you get the blue line. And you see for a large number of cores, we actually now have CPU architecture with dozens of cores. So also these numbers look large. They're actually not so large anymore. Um, you can see even if, you're, if only 1% of your code is not parallelized, you see how actually for a large number of cores there's this huge gap between what you would naively expect and what you actually get. And for the problems we typically work on, what's probably more realistic is that, I don't know, you have like 5 or 10% of your code is not parallel. And then you see for the red line, it actually does make a difference if you run your program now on 10 cores or 100 cores. The runtime is essentially the same. So with 10, with 10 cores, your problem is like at the maximum speed already, as long as you don't make the um, cores faster. So keep that in mind. Parallelizing is usually difficult, at least if you want to scale it to a large number of cores. And these days, you have in desktop computers, you sometimes have octa cores. So 10 cores is really not so exotic anymore. So anyway, some general remarks. What do you do if you want to split up if you want to uh, speed up your program by parallel methods. Basically, you have one big computational problem, and then you would have to split it up into smaller computational problems. These smaller computational problems you would solve in parallel on several cores, and then in the end, you combine the results of these sub-problems to the result of this overall problem. And you have to be careful to choose the right size, because if these sub-problems are very small, for example, the very first code I showed, we started a sub-process for cubing a number. Then you introduce a huge overhead for a very simple problem. So if your problems are too small, actually, uh, you won't get a speed up. You will get exactly the opposite, because the overhead is too big compared to the problem size. And on the other hand, if your subproblems are very large, you get problems with load balancing, usually. Because if you have very large problems, usually the problems are not exactly of the same size. So you usually have that at the end of the computations, there's one or two cores which are still working on the sub-problem while all the other cores are done, and they're basically just idling. So you're also not fully utilizing the cores. And something which is important to keep in mind, parallel programming in general is just difficult. If you don't parallelize something trivial, then it's very easy to introduce erratic bugs. So you have to be very careful when you implement something. Because the main problem is just executions are not necessarily in order anymore. You cannot. You just cannot assume that a, a certain subprocess writes something to memory location before the other process reads it, because these orders are not fixed anymore. 
So you have to be uh, very careful. Okay, so let's go, uh, let's uh, do some more practical things. Let's jump into the API of the multiprocessing module. Just an overview about the most uh, important things to get started. The most simple strategy to parallelize something is probably a so-called worker pool, which you find in the multiprocessing module. So multiprocessing.pool is a worker pool object. Um, so you usually, this pool basically defines one worker process per one physical core. And then this nice pool object, which is very high level, has certain functions which you can apply to it. There's a map function, which basically works like the inbuilt map function of Python, only now that this map will be executed truly in parallel. So this pool object will distribute the, uh, the map arguments to different cores, evaluate that in parallel, and then give you the result back, which of course only makes sense if your function is sufficiently complicated to evaluate. There's also an asynchronous version of it, so you can actually submit a map evaluation to the pool, then do other computations, and then at a later time check back if these computations have been finished. So the asynchronous function, they always immediately return while the computations run in the background. Then you can do other stuff, and at a later time when you need the actual results, you can pull it and then ask for the result. So um, this is asynchronous map and then uh, uh, asynchronous uh, function evaluation. So it's really if you, have a, if you want to call a function with certain arguments that takes a lot of time, you can just ask to the pool to evaluate this. You do other computation at a later time, you can check um, if this function evaluation has been finished. So this asynchronous function evaluation. Now all this convenience comes with a certain price because there are some severe limitations. Um, First of all, the pool object can only deal with pickable objects. So you cannot use parallel maps with lambda expressions, for example, or with nested functions. It's just a limitation of the implementation of the multiprocessing dot pool object. What you can use is global functions. You can use global classes. And what's very important if you use this module more often is uh, you can use partial functions. So if you take a function, you fix certain arguments, then you get a partial function using the functools.partial method. You can actually use the pool object together with these partial functions. And um, if you want to try these things, uh, don't be surprised if they're not working in, a, in an interactive shell. There's another limitation of this nice module because in order for this module to work, the main module has to be importable by the children which does not work in, a, in, a, um, in the interactive interpreter. So this pool object, you just cannot, uh, um, it just won't work in an interactive session. <coughs> okay, so uh, how would you do a parallel map? All the examples I have are fairly simple, but just imagine whenever we have a simple function here in a real life setting, you would have a function which takes a lot of time to evaluate. So we have here our simple function again, which is just cubing a number. And if you want to use now a parallel map, first you would start a pool object. You can actually specify with processes how many processes you want to start. By default, it just starts one sub-process per physical core, which usually makes sense because typically more than one sub-process per physical core doesn't make sense um, besides introducing more overhead. Um, well, and then you can really you can use it like the normal map from Python. So in Python, you would write something like that, map cube range zero from nine, if you want to have all the cube numbers from zero to nine. Now here we do the same, but with p dots. So because p is our pool object, so p dot map this. Now the difference is that actually now uh, all the cores will evaluate this function for different arguments. So this evaluation will be actually done truly in parallel, which of course doesn't make sense for such a trivial function. But if you imagine this here to be a fairly complicated function, which takes seconds to evaluate, then this one will be much faster than this one. Well, this is, a, this is a synchronous version, so it will only return after the computation has been finished. You can print it out, and well, you get the result what you expect. Um, you can also do asynchronous function evaluation. So uh, if you define some functions and you want to evaluate them in the background while you do some other stuff, again, you can start a pool object, and then you can apply functions you can apply certain arguments to certain functions. This immediately returns. These are the asynchronous versions. It immediately returns. It gives you this object here. 
while this evaluation is now done in the background, in the worker pool, you can do computations here. And later, when you need the result, you can, you can ask for them using the get method. This will now block until the computation actually have been finished. And then you get the result back. So, um, what, what does the block? Sorry? Line 14, all the gets block? Um, These ones are blocking, yeah. So in, in what, what you would do in a practical setting, you would do something like this. You call the app, uh, asynchronous function evaluation. And here where the comment is, I'm not sure if you can see, he would now actually insert some code which is doing some useful stuff. For example, some other function evaluations, or you do here some input output, whatever. And then at the later stage, then you would call the get function to actually get the result. The hope is that by then, this function evaluation has been finished already. In case it has not been finished, it will just block until it gets the result. But the, the bottom line of this example is really that here where the command line is, you do something useful. Otherwise, this is uh, kind of pointless. Yeah. OK, so if you're not working on very trivial problems, you usually have to have that um, these subprocesses have to communicate with each other. They have to share state. They have to share information. So uh, what do you do? There are some uh, things shipped with the multiprocessing module. Um, one simple one is uh, so-called shared memory maps. Because as I told you, each of these subprocesses with a multiprocessing module is an own self-sufficient memory uh, um, location together with a Python interpreter. So they will all have their own sets of variables. So per se, they cannot communicate by sharing some memory locations. However, um, there is such an implementation in this module. And it basically behaves like a normal list. With the difference is now that the elements in this list, they will be shared among all processes. So if one subprocess is writing to that shared memory map, you can actually see the result in a different um, subprocess. So you can, this, this thing will be automatically shared in the background. So it's very high level, very convenient. And yeah, you basically use it like a list. Um, you initialize it slightly different. The first argument is you have to specify what data type you have. So i is integer. You can also use d for double. You initialize it. And then the shared array just behaves like an array, only that now magically in the background it's being um, shared among all processes. And now if you use this function here, which is taking an array and just cubing all elements, if you now start this in a separate subprocess, so this will be running in an own interpreter instance, and we give it our shared array, then this, this uh, other subprocess will read from it, uh, do some manipulation, and write the result back. And also, this now has been done in a different subprocess. You can actually see, after the computations have been finished, you can actually see the results in the main process. So keep in mind, this actually now, we have two subprocesses running here at the same time. We have the, the main program, which uh, uh, which runs as a parent process, and then we start a child subprocess, which is just executing this function. So in general, after you start the subprocess, you could also do here some useful computations, just some other stuff, until this function has terminated. So this allows you to share um, array-like objects among subprocesses. If you have to use more complicated data structures, for example, you want to use a dictionary, you can use a so-called memory manager. So you would initialize a memory manager, and then it has some certain method, for example, to create a dictionary. Now this dictionary just behaves like a normal dictionary, only with the difference that this one is now also automatically shared among all <coughs> subprocesses. So if we initialize it with something, and we call a subprocess, which is um, writing to it, reading from it, and manipulating it, then actually the result we will also see in the main process. Now, this memory manager is very convenient and very high level, and it comes that the price is actually very slow. So um, the more low, low, I mean, this convenience really comes at the price of speed. So um, if possible, try um, to stick to simpler, uh, low, to more low-level stuff, then it's, it's faster. An alternative is you use um, inter-process communication. For example, you can use a pipe, which is just a two-way communication channel. So you can, create a, uh, you can create a pipe. It gives you two ends of the pipe. You can give one pipe to, uh, to your child, to your subprocess, and you keep one to yourself. And then you can just send stuff over to your child. This one receives it. Well, let's do some data manipulation and sends it back. 
and then a parent process can receive it. So this is a pipe, it's just a two-way communication channel. You get two ends, you give one to one subprocess, you keep one in the other subprocess, and you can send and receive via this communication channel. Which works well if you have two subprocesses. If you have a lot, you could use a queue object. So this queue object is a multi-consumer, multi-producer FIFO queue. So um, you can actually share this queue with many processes and they all read and write to this object and they all communicate via this queue object. So um, I have to hurry up a bit because I'm running out of time, but here um, some, some trivial example. We have now uh, a subprocess here which just writes some, some uh, data to the queue. One process which reads, uh, which reads from the queue, then cubing all these numbers and writing it back. And then we have the main process here, which then uh, reads the final result. So we have here also now three subprocesses. They're all reading and writing to the queue. So the queue, a queue you can also use if you have to communicate among a large number of subprocesses. Well, a pipe is good for process to process direct communication. Okay, some short guidelines. Um, as I said, um, so uh, uh, multiprocessing can help you speed up your problems, uh, your programs, but it comes at a price. First of all, it adds a lot of complexity to your code, potentially, if you're not having a very simple program. Um, so the most important thing is only use it as a, how to say, um, better use a good algorithm in serial than a bad algorithm in parallel. So if you can try to avoid using parallel methods, then avoid it. Otherwise, if you have good algorithms, you have good data structures, but you still need more computation power, then you go with that. But um, don't try to make a bad algorithm run faster by parallelizing it, because then you get really bad, messy code, very difficult to maintain, very easy to introduce bugs. And then, so if you really have to use parallel methods, there are some guidelines. Um, try to, try to uh, avoid sharing of state. Because if you have memory locations where several processes are reading and writing at the same time, it's very easy to introduce bugs. Of course, this is easy set because only the, the most trivial problems don't require you to communicate. But try to minimize it as, as much as possible just to uh, reduce possible error sources. And then if you need to share, you can use memory maps like the array or the manager object, or you use direct inter-process communication. So point-to-point -point communication is a pipe. If you have many producers and many uh, consumers, you use a queue object. And there are some limitations, um, which you also have to keep in mind, so especially on Windows platforms. Um, for example, if you use global variables uh, under Windows, you can end up with inconsistencies. Um, so the good practice is just to avoid using global variables at all. Best practice is to every resource a child process needs, you share explicitly in the argument list. Furthermore, um, under Windows you always require, not only for the pool object, but in general you require that the main module has to be importable by the children. That's why in all my example source codes you saw this name main guard, because you want to import the main module without any um, unintended side effects happening. So you usually have to uh, protect the entry point of your program by this name main guard construct. And then, last but not least, uh, try to not terminate processes, because if you have a process which is accessing a shared uh, resource and you terminate it, before it has finished its operations, you might actually corrupt all these shared resources. So usually you just try to start a process and wait until it actually finished its computation, but you just don't terminate it brute force because then lots of things can go wrong. Um, and as always, read the um, documentary. There are also some programming guidelines. It's very helpful, so feel free to go there and read up some more stuff. I think I ran out of time. Um, I wanted to show a very short demo, but I think we don't have any more time. A simple example would be a, 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 a slightly more interesting non-trivial example for parallel computing would be uh, numerical integration, because you can split up a large integral uh, to a sum of small integrals. These small integrals you can then evaluate in parallel on several cores and then combine the result. But I think we ran out of time. <laughs>
So um, if you want to see the demo code, feel free to go to the GitHub. There are two files, a serial implementation of numerical implementation, uh, a serial implementation of numerical integration and a parallel version. And yeah, are there any questions? There is, there is. So it basically, it basically works. Okay, you saw the synchronous version. Um, sorry. So the asynchronous version works almost like the synchronous version, only that this one returns directly. So then this mapping will be also done in the background, in the worker pool. And then at the end, when you actually want to pull the result, you would also use rest.get. It's like the asynchronous function evaluation. You get an object which allows you to pull the current state of the computations. You can't, and you can't get on the result. Yeah. Uh, you, there are also some other methods to ask if the computations are still running, if they're finished already. So it, it actually gives you a very high level object here to, to allow you to check what's the current state of your computations and then ask for the result as soon as it's finished. The map function itself gives you uh, something you can pull for stats? Correct, yeah. Basically, the asynchronous map gives you something which is similar to what the uh, asynchronous function evaluation gives you. So it doesn't give you the result. It just gives you an object to pull for the result and check if the computations have been finished already. And in practice, can you just see what percent of uh, items in the array have I don't believe so. Perhaps you could implement something with shared memory maps where you keep track of computation. But this object here is very simple in the sense of only allows you to ask, does a, is the computation done or not? And if it's done, please give me the result. And well, if you need the result and the computations don't have uh, uh, finished, then you just call the get object that will block until you actually have the result. Any more questions? <coughs> so um, these pool objects, um, they actually take significant time to start, especially on Windows where subprocess takes a lot of time to start. So typically you don't want that every function is starting the own pool process, doing some computations and then um, you, you want probably one major problem where you start a pool object at the beginning of the computation and then use these pool objects throughout your whole computations. Where you, you, this pool object, you can, you, can, you can invoke the map function and the asynchronous function evaluation as often as you want. But you don't want to end up for every single computation you want to do in parallel to initialize a new pool object. You probably want to share this pool object to avoid this overhead when starting it. Questions? If not, 